If you are thinking about raising some meat, awesome. Today, we're going to help you do that. All right. What kind of meat? How in, could you choose? There's so many options out there. In this episode, we're going to pick three easy get started meat animals. Meat easy animals. to raise and also to process on your homestead. Yeah. And these are the three we started with ourselves. Yeah. I don't think there's an easier way to fill your freezer or your larder, your pantry, uh, basically put food away for your family, reduce your grocery bill from your homestead than raising meat. Because I think for generally most families, the protein, the meat is what is going to cost the most for them. Yeah. And also, a lot of us, I think protein is a big part of our diet. So I know for us, when we started raising our own meat, we went from raising 0% of our own food or maybe like 3% with like garden tomatoes and lettuce to suddenly you look at your plate and you know, half, almost half of your plate, steak, bacon, eggs, we were able to raise, I guess eggs are Technically. That is quite the meal, steak, bacon, and eggs on that dinner plate. <laughs> no, they were different meals. Like if you look at your plate and it's a salad and a steak, or if you look at your plate and it's bacon, eggs, and cheese. <laughs> it's funny because it's been so long since I've bought meat at the grocery store. Like I don't remember what it was like. I don't remember how I would even do it. <laughs> We want to help everybody listening, everybody watching, get started. We've been raising our own meat for a decade, and we would like you guys, if it's something that you want to do, we'd like to help you get started. Today we have three more beginner level, easy to start with raising your own meat projects that we want to share. So let's dive in. Why, what's the point of raising your own meat? Why do it? There's no better way to save money on your food no easier way, uh, no easier way to fill your larder up with food for your family. And then even, you know, right now, when you look back on what happened with COVID and is still happening, right? We are hearing about in the news constantly shortage on this, shortage on that. If you're worried about self-sufficiency, food shortages, food supply chains, and how fragile they are, being able to go to your backyard butcher a chicken, butcher a rabbit, butcher a pig. There's a lot of comfort in that. Yeah, it does take off some of that anxiety. And I think it just, you know, you can have a garden and have some lettuce and tomatoes, but man, you put 100 chickens away for the year and you got a lot of food. Mm -hmm. So today we're gonna go over three easy to produce meats. And this is the cool thing about this list. All these animals are easy to source, so you can either order them online or find them locally pretty much anywhere. They're easy animals to work with. They're not something that you're gonna get, you know, you need years and years to master. And everything on our list today is quick turnaround. We're talking six months. Maximum. Maximum, six weeks minimum. So you can literally be putting meat in your freezer in two months. Yeah, skip having animals during the cold of the year or your oh, yeah. your hot season, your fly season, whatever season you want to skip and not have any animals to raise for meat. That's the nice thing about these. And no breeding. This was a really big one. Breeding is where so many things can go wrong. This list That's is... when you have to have animals year round. Yeah. No, this list is everything you can get and be done with in a couple of months. So let's start at the smallest to the largest. Smallest and I would say easiest. Yeah. All around easiest if you look at everything. Yeah, all around I would agree. All around easiest. The, the meat bird. The meat chicken. The Cornish cross chicken. We recommend starting with the Cornish cross because it's a great product. They get a bad, bad rap. But in our experience, they'll walk, they'll graze, they're, sure they're lazy, but I mean, that's good. <laughs> we want a big fat lazy chicken. Yeah. I don't want something to running around everywhere. 
Yeah. I like a, a tender chicken for the breast. You, I want that kind of like chicken we're used to, and that's what we get with the Cornish cross. That's an interesting point. Uh, I was just listening to somebody talk about, oh, it was John Siskovich in their, uh, the SmackDown, our last episode of our podcast. And he was talking about meat and what gives it certain character. And a lot of movement creates tougher, darker meat, which is good in roasts and is good in other, you know, things. And, that we yeah, and we like that in the dark meat. Right. But, but not super tough. But if you're used to a big roaster chicken that you serve the whole thing to your friends and family, that comes from a nice, lazy Cornish cross. I, I had, I pulled a chicken out of the freezer and I usually do a spatchcock, so you cut out the backbone, kind of open it and set it in your pan, and it cooks really fast, 45 minutes or so. So I got this chicken out, and I thawed it, and I tried to cut out the backbone, and I couldn't do it. What is wrong with this chicken? I, like, I, I thought it fast. Did that do it? But it hasn't happened before. So I got Austin to try to cut it out. <laughs> I, like, bent my scissors in yeah, half. Yeah, it was really hard And to I was like, okay. Out. Well, all right, I'll just cook it then. I threw it in the oven, 45 minutes, I took it out, and it was like chewing on leather. <laughs> and then I realized I had accidentally pulled out one of the roosters we butchered, one of our heritage breeds roosters, cooked it like a Cornish, and it was inedible. Like, you couldn't even bite through the skin. The skin was like rubber. It didn't get juicy, crispy, fatty. It was inedible. So I threw it back in the Instapot for like an hour, and that fixed it. But... <laughs> I feel like when we start out raising this for the first batch, try your Cornish because you're going to get what you're used to. And I think even better, you'll be proud of it and pleased with it. Yeah, that's a big one. And, uh, you know, you can later on, you can experiment with other birds. But specifically, yeah. this project we're encouraging beginners is order some Cornish cross meat birds. All right. So pros and cons of chickens, meat chickens. Pros. They're delicious. <laughs> chicken is delicious. A yeah. roasted chicken, like, and the chickens we raise have such a nice layer of fat when you roast them. It all goes on the bottom, and then you take your Ooh, chicken yeah. and scoop it up and yeah. eat it. It's delicious. Crispy chicken. Get your potatoes down there. Skin. Your chicken. Yeah. Chicken is very delicious, also very common. So yep. we all know how to cook a chicken. Yeah, it doesn't freak anybody out when we have company over and we serve a chicken that we raised. It looks exactly like what they're used yes. to. They make nice gifts. When people come and do jobs on the farm for us, we always send them home with a, either eggs or a chicken. Uh, people know what to do with it. Variety, right? You can get chicken breasts, chicken thighs, drumsticks. Wings. Wings. So delicious. Plus the carcass, the necks for stock. Yeah. Chicken soup. Yep. Uh, and then the best part of the, the chicken, if you're going to pick, we're going to go over three today, and our advice to you is kind of pick one of them that fits you uh, time-wise. Six weeks to eight weeks is kind of your sweet spot on the meat birds. So, yeah, you can have a bunch of meat pretty quickly. Yeah, and they're low low cost to get into them. Chicks are uh, 2 to $4 to start if you're buying the male Cornish cross chicks. When we first did our first meat batch of meat birds, this was when we lived in Connecticut. We had a small little farm, no pasture, no fancy infrastructure. We had this little fallen down chicken coop that was out back in the yard. It had been, a, I think, a kid's play, play yeah, house. Uh, we just wound up putting a lock on the door. Plywood on the floor so yep. the rats couldn't get in. And boarding up the windows that had holes in them. And for literally whatever it took to fix that little thing up, we were raising, I think we did the first batch was 10 birds. 10? Okay. Yeah. So very simple to get started, very quick to get started. But there are some cons to the meat chickens. Yeah, you Speaking do. Speaking of predators. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They'll attract because they're not, uh, they're pretty visible. They're white. So they really stand out. They're not fast. <laughs> no, they're not fast. So they can't run away from anything. They're, they're kind of like sitting fast. ducks. Or chickens. And you do have to, if you're getting them as chicks, you'd have to have a brooding setup for them. Yeah, so that's unique. You can't get them when it's too cold. You have to be careful when it gets too hot when they're big. Uh, good thing you mentioned chicks. One of the cons to raising meat birds, chicks are very fragile. 
So you're going to have some deaths, you're going to lose some birds, so that's something you got to be ready for. And then you have to be aware that they do grow very quickly and they'll need a high protein feed. You'll need to, some people suggest taking them off of feed in the evenings. This is specific to the Cornish cross because they're such a fast growing bird. And, and when it gets hot, they do need like a large bowl of water to drink from or some like kind of a cup. They don't yeah, do well with the, the nipple uh, waters for chickens when yeah. it's really hot. All right. Another area where this is super beneficial to get a Cornish cross is on butcher day. Yeah, that's that's a hundred percent true. They are much easier to process. They're easier, so this would be a pro, right? They're easier. For sure. They're, that's what I said. A oh, good reason to go with Cornish cross, especially is on butcher. They're day. much easier to butcher than an old rooster. Their feathers Even come a out. Even young rooster. Yeah. Oh yeah. Their feathers come out easier. Their bones when oh, you're cutting them, it's when you're so working with it. It's so hard to butcher a rooster. Your hands at the end of the day, 10 old roosters, 10 young roosters, heritage breed versus 10 Cornish, you're going to feel better. Do your roosters first because then oh, yeah. when you get to the Cornish, it's like cutting through butter. Yeah. Cutting those feet off compared to a rooster. A rooster, you're like sawing oh. it off, break your hand. But the Cornish is just like snip, snip. <laughs> and they're much easier to pluck. What do you need to get started? Bare bones minimum to get started with Cornish Cross. Some place for them to live. So you got all Shelter. your chick brooding stuff. Right. You can get them as chicks from a hatchery and have them shipped to you. Or you can go to Tractor Supply will have them, Agway, places like that. You'll need a basic chick brooding setup. Some place warm. Be careful. Don't get them when it's cold. We did that. They are... A more fragile bird you don't want to expose them to too much cold so keep them in a nice ambient temperature in the 90s for them and then make sure like before they arrive correct food mm -hmm. not just corn ground up or corn kernels but find a grower chicken feed a starter a chicken chick starter, feed yeah Find a chick starter and then a chick grower and make sure you have both ready and you know when to switch over from one to the next. Yeah. Then you'll just need shelter for them. Secure shelter, an old chicken coop, a chicken tractor you can build. So that's one of the cool things. As opposed to doing like egg laying chickens, you could just do a chicken tractor. Yeah, they don't need to roost. If you're looking at how can I do this the most cost effective way, a chicken tractor is cheaper usually to build than a chicken coop. So you could build for a couple hundred bucks, you can build a chicken tractor. It's not gonna be good in the winter time, but- But you don't wanna do them in the winter time they're anyways. Gone. Yeah. They're not there, yeah. so. They don't do good with big extremes and yeah. weather. And they actually, these Cornish crosses, they don't need to roost. They get so big and fat. They'll roost the medium they term, will. but mm -hmm. by yeah, the time they're ready the for processing, they're like- They don't have that drive now. You want me up there? Sorry, buddy. <laughs> and then it's what you need for butcher day. You can butcher a meat chicken with a knife. Great. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> We're going deep here. Let us uh, illuminate the possibilities to you. <laughs> you can keep it really really simple but there are a few things that if you get this kind of bare bones beginner setup will make life easier so get yourself a nice sharp knife to cut the chicken something to contain the chicken while you're cutting it yeah this can be a notch in a log i've seen old timers put a notch in a log slide the chicken's head and whack it off with an axe it can be a killing cone we like killing cones those work really good just something to contain it yeah the killing cone calms the chicken down you put them in it and it's snug they're upside down it's kind of a a woozy drowsy going to sleep experience for the chicken yeah so simple after you've bled the chicken out you're going to want to scald it so a pot over a that makes it burner. so much easier to get the feathers out you can dry pluck it but it's a lot harder yeah yeah so that'll that'll make your life better once it's plucked knife opens it up you do the gutting so you have a table there yep table couple cutting tables, boards some cutting boards knives and then whatever you want to package it in could be a ziploc bag 
it's not going to be the nicest looking thing. But again, this is like just an easy project to get started with. If you want to be fancy, you can get those shrink wrap bags. You dip them in a pot of hot water, super hot water, and shoo, the plastic shrinks onto your chicken, and it looks exactly like a supermarket bird. That's one of the coolest moments when you shrink wrap that chicken, and it's like, hey, super bird. It is funny. Like, we're... We're better than the store, but when it looks like something so from the proud. store, you feel so proud. Look at that. I did it. I matched the store. What are you going to get? From what do we want? Big meat bird. Uh, yeah, nice sized bird, five pounds. We've had six or seven pounds. Those yeah. are big. We've had the hens be four pounds. Yep. So, yeah, four to six pounds. You're going to get all that meat. One little, here's a pro tip. We like to snip off when we're doing a whole roaster bird. We snip off the wings. And we have a separate bag of all the wings. So we have our roaster birds. We have all our wings. I just think how funny they look when you take them out of the bag and they have no wings. <laughs> but that means we can have big wing nights. Yeah, which are awesome. Uh, in addition to wings and your regular chicken meat, you also have the neck, which you don't always get with your chicken. What do you use the neck for? Uh, stocks. Stocks. Soups, yeah. Chicken so stock and soups. Chicken Hearts. gizzards. Gizzards. Chicken gizzards are work. They're a lot of work. People like them. They're really yummy. If you've never had them and you think like, eh, you got to try them. They're really, really good. They're a ton of work Hearts, to prepare. Uh, livers. Chicken liver. Oh, we love the hearts, though. I think that's chicken our hearts. favorite. Yeah. We heart the heart. <laughs> That's like our week of chicken butchering treat is chicken hearts. They're firm. If you've never had a heart, it's like denser, sweeter meat than the rest of the chicken. Got a nice chew to it. A little fry in the pan. Really good. I love hearing you describe it. Oh, chicken heart. And a pro tip. <laughs> Order pizza on Chicken Butcher Day because you're not going to want to eat chicken. <laughs> yeah, that's a funny one. I remember Don Siskovich used to say they would do their butcher days and they'd have a grill there. And they would, while they were butchering, they'd grill a bunch of chicken to feed everybody. And then they'd take some of them and they'd package them for like ready-made meals. Awesome idea. But the last thing I want to eat on Chicken Butcher Day is chicken. I know where my chickens came from. I'm okay with that. It doesn't gross me out. But I just like... It's the smell. I've had my hand on the inside of a chicken for the whole yeah, it's day. It's the smell, I think, all day that really... Yeah, like, so Okay, no more chicken. Us, personally, we always get, like, pizza, but... It's a long day, yeah. And that's yeah. why we recommend starting with what is a manageable number. Yeah. And for me, probably 15 chicks. 15 chicks. 15 chicks, um... I like the idea of doing 10 your first batch. That's what we did. Butchering your first birds are going to take you a long time. And, uh... Yeah, it's a long day. It's a long day. But if you're raising them, I feel like, especially with chicks, the prospect of losing some, I say order 15. Kind of cushion yourself a little bit. Maybe you'll only end up getting 12 to butcher. Yeah, right? that could be. It's not a big difference. Yeah. And uh, that's 12 manageable. butchering, that's six hours. Yep. Most of the things we're going to talk about today, I really suggest your first time you do them and raise them, you find a butcher. Chickens, I kind of feel like you can handle it. Oh, well, yeah. And chickens, sometimes you can even find someone who has butchered chickens before, have them come and show you. That's what yeah. we did for our first time. Yeah. Awesome. If you can find that, uh, that's a great way. If not, if you don't have a buddy who can join you and teach you, I can be your buddy to join you and teach you. In the Pioneer Library, we have an entire, like the whole process that we use start to finish, showing you how to butcher that chicken. And I think we're, we're using equipment in that video, Yeah. right? But the same applies to just doing it with a pot on the stove as it does to a scalder. Yeah, yeah, so whether you're dunking it in a professional and scalder or... Another thing is, if you do start doing bigger batches, there are people who will rent their equipment out, so... yeah. Once you start doing bigger batches. Start with 10, and if you love it and you think, hey, I can do more than this, every year now, our batch of chicken, we do 50 to 100 birds in a batch mm -hmm. once or twice a year, and we have enough chicken. We haven't bought chicken in a decade. It's 
been decades since we went to the store and bought it. Number two. All right, so that was chicken was the first one. Take a minute to guess. Number one was chicken. Number two, what's your guess? What do you think? Number two on the list. Yes, and these are rated, I think, easiest to hardest. Oh, I don't know about that. Nah, well, <sighs> we'll figure it out. Okay, so number two is? Lamb. Yum. Yum. <laughs> Lamb is delicious. So good. It's like one of the most under enjoyed meats, I think, by the average American. American. Yeah. We know our culture and what what people interact with our farm stuff. Lamb is like they have it once a year if they like it. Yeah. If they yeah, like it, it's like a special meal. I think culturally in our area here not many people eat lamb. Yeah, no. Or they eat it once a year. Yeah. You know, it's like a Easter. I was going to say Christmas lamb, but that's a different thing. A goose. <laughs> Easter lamb. Easter lamb, yeah. Some holiday, like, the outcomes of lamb, and then that's it. We eat lamb. Well, now we do, but we didn't used to. No. Because I, I didn't grow up eating lamb. Did you? No, I didn't either. And So thought, I never bought lamb because it's very expensive. Very expensive. And then the first time you try it, it's a very different flavor. So the first time I tried it, my aunts were raising sheep and they gave us some lamb and it was ground lamb and I had no idea what to do with it. So I threw it in spaghetti sauce <laughs> and it was really bad. Yeah. It w We're like, this tastes so funny. This, this is a strong flavor. It's not like, tastes like everything tastes like chicken. It's not beef. It's not that neutral meat flavor we've become accustomed to. It has flavor. Gyros. Sometimes. That's where I had lamb and liked it. But like, that's such a different thing, gyro. And that's what I think you have to accept with lamb is it will be different flavorings and different seasonings. You're not and replacing then you'll re no, you grandma's can't just, meatballs. You can't throw it in and with a, a beef dish. and it's, yeah. it's not a lasagna kind no, of thing. No, this is not you a replacement. You have to switch up your seasonings and your sauces. And yeah. I didn't realize that. And, and learn how to use it. Once we finally had like lamb cooked the way it should be, we both fell in love with when it. Yeah, lamb's one of our favorites now. Why? Because it's so good. It's so good. It's just so rich and distinct and just really yummy I like my me like i like my men <laughs> rich and distinct sorry keep looking <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth um <laughs> trying to think what kind of meat you would be yeah i'm trying to get, think i feel like bacon like a pot roast i feel like i'm a no i am not a pot roast <laughs> That's a diss in our house. Nobody likes Nobody pot roast. Nobody likes pot roast. <laughs> Your pot roast. I feel like I'm bacon. Like, maybe... Smoky? You, you know, everybody dog. likes bacon. <laughs> you think you're bacon? That's a really confident thing Except to say. Except for the very few people who hate it. There's a very, there's, okay, very there's confident thing to say. There's a small section of humanity who just hates bacon. There's a small section of humanity who hates me. And then everybody else likes me. And everybody else likes bacon. And some people just love me. <laughs> Pot roast. <laughs> I think you'd be like a shoulder. Cook me for a long you're a time shoulder. and I'm nice and tender. You, you're, you are you not... Like break down all my connective tissue. Yes. And make me nice and juicy. And you're not, you don't fit into every application. You are a very specific kind of thing that does so well in this. And is not for all this. You are saying you're bacon. You can be can, good anywhere. You, you can, can be literally on donuts, sprinkle me on anything. Salad. <laughs> it's a, that is a your bold shoulder. Statement. Shoulders like such the best cut on the pig is the pig shoulder that connects. Nobody tissue, thinks the that. The best cut on the pig is bacon. <laughs> <laughs> what cut of meat are you? Leave us a comment in the comment section. Let us know. You bacon? Shoulder? Pot roast. That was always my favorite cut. See? You're my favorite cut. That's why I picked it. My favorite cut. Pig shoulder. Not shanks. Well, people, and then it's pulled pork, right? But it takes time to really appreciate it. I'm not disagreeing with you. It's the bacon statement that I just don't know. You don't think I'm bacon. He's in the booth. No, you're not bacon. This is microphone. Are you a ham? You're ham. That's nah. what you are.
<laughs> da, he's such a ham. I hate ham, to be honest. <gasps> no. I want to grind up all no. our hams. Oh, hams. Oh, ham salad. Mmm, so good. Ham's so good. Okay, so moving on. Moving on. I don't think lambs work in everybody's homestead. Ooh. I think chickens do. Do we talk about the pros of lamb? Other than this is we how I'm getting so into oh, it. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Jesus good Christ. Way. We did really smooth the Twice. transition. Twice. I'm girl. trying. Okay. So, why? Why don't they work on everybody's? <laughs> because if you want to do it cost effectively, mm -hmm. you want to grass feed. So if you are living in the middle of the woods, lambs, no, that's not a true. good choice. You're going to yeah. be hay feeding. Yep. Or and that grain. doesn't make sense. No, not I. I think the draw of lambs is think of just grass fed. You don't have to grain them. Yeah. They can just get fat off of your grass. They are one of the most self sufficient animals if you have the pasture. And I think this is why we didn't ever do them in Connecticut. Yeah, we had an awful property in Connecticut for for uh, yeah. It was a mountain with pine trees. Right, and uh, rhododendron. <laughs> and rhododendron, which will kill them. So, <laughs> fun. Uh, but the pros of them are they are grass fed. They you will save money because lamb at the supermarket is very expensive. This blows my mind. Why is the animal that we can literally like ninety percent grass feed? Uh, other than I mean, hey, if you why is it so expensive? Hay, why is it so expensive? I mean, in this country, it's how it is. Is it just not? If I had my own it, It's use, not done as much as beef is. Is the land requirements different? I don't know. Comment. Let me know. If you're a lamb producer, lambs themselves, the little baby lambs, are so expensive per pound. Lamb meat is so expensive. Whatever it is, um, you will save a ton of money if you raise your own grass-fed grass lambs. Grass-fed lamb yeah. versus and buying it at the supermarket. The, we could never afford to eat lamb as much as we No, do. and like we said... Big pro for us is it's just delicious. Yeah, yeah. We really, really like really the good. meat. That's why rabbits aren't on here. No, so, that is true. I was thinking about that. Rabbits are an easy meat to do, but... But there's breeding involved them. in rabbits. There's <laughs> year-round breeding involved with rabbits. So yeah, that's, that's why tricky. they're not on it's the tricky. list. Uh, Cons of lambs. Cons. Not everything is perfect about lambs. <laughs> Especially if... The, the big one is if, they're, if you have a ton of grass, great. If you don't... Now, even Forget if you do have it. a ton of grass, the fencing requirements are, uh, yeah, tough with lambs. They do require some good fencing. So you either got to bite the bullet and just invest in a huge perimeter fence. And for the record, the lambs can get out of a perimeter fencing, of a high tensile fencing. That is not yeah. ideal for sheep or lambs. Well, no, you, you'd have to do, the best thing for sheep is the woven wire. Right. Yeah, we didn't right. even do that. Which is, It is yeah, very expensive. cost prohibitive. So you either got to just do that or you build yourself like a holding pen that's escape proof and really good to train and then you train them in that and to then electric do the um, then you can do rotational electric as long yeah. as you have really well trained lambs who will return because to you. they'll phew, right over it the lambs are very tricky with defense that's another con is just working with them they're kind of a freaky Lambs get very freaked out easily. If you're not the person who bred them, if they don't know you, and you just buy feeder lambs, they're not going to trust you. They're going to run from you. You're going to spook them. So. Let's say they get out of their pen, and they get away from you, and you think, well, they'll be back. Uh, then no, sometimes no. Sometimes you'll find just a leg of them over the hill. We had a uh, we had a, a neighbor call us one day and he said, "Hey, are you guys missing a lamb?" This was back the first year we did lambs, I believe. Yeah, yeah, we are missing a lamb. He goes, "I said, did you find it?" He said, "Part of it, just the leg." <laughs> the day we got home with our lambs, we tucked them in, thought they were in an escape roof area, jumped over, one got away, and the next day we called and called and looked and looked and. No. Couldn't find nothing. it. And uh, a couple of days later, the neighbor saw a lamb, up on, a leg of lamb up on the hill. It's like a wooly thing up on the hill, and yeah. that was part of our lamb. All that we ever found of it. So, yeah, yeah they are... So predators, there is something to worry about with lambs as well. That's another good con. Yep, they are going to be susceptible to predation, especially because lambs, by nature, are little. Yes. Easy to kill. Yeah. So. And delicious. Oh, yeah. We're not the only ones who want to eat them. Then you're dealing with worms. We haven't... 
With feeder lambs, the goal is don't keep them that long that you'll have an issue with worms. Yeah, but, but so... But do the same principles that you would do if you're raising sheep or goats. Keep their feet off the ground and make sure they're not grazing their grass too low. We've never lost a feeder lamb, something that we bought at like three months old, to finishing point before winter. Yeah, we've never had them die. We've never Unless lost Unless we one. killed them. Well, I mean... We killed that one early. Yeah, something was why. up with that one, but we never lost no. two worms. Never lost so, them to worms. Whereas we have in our goats, history yes. lost goats to worms, rams to worms. We've dealt with loss to worms. They can get your lambs, but usually because lambs are not going through something like a birth or, you know, some stress or years of yeah, problems not, with yeah. this. Usually you can get by they were, without... Yes, just be aware. Just, be aware. just use the... The practical steps you can that you would do with a sheep or a goat to keep them from not getting wormy. Yeah. So if you want to have lambs on your homestead, your bare minimum, we talked about this already a little, but your perimeter fence, fencing. a good holding pen, this is really, really important. So good solid fencing. Water. They are, not, when they're on fresh green grass, they don't go through buckets and buckets like a cow does but yeah. they still need constant access to fresh yeah. water and some shade they appreciate yeah. shade too when it gets hot yeah they're by nature usually going to be a little warmer of a creature so make sure you get some shade and that can be as simple for us as we have a little hoop house that we drag around with them and they get to yeah. go hide under yeah or we use the chicken tractor tarps oh man cool yeah yeah cool pro tip here uh if you let's say you're like uh, this year i'm gonna do the meat birds and then next year i'll do lambs so Scovitz chicken tractors work really good as combo chicken tractor lampshade. If you know what a Scovitz chicken tractor looks like, it's like a little, they call that the Gothic arch, right? Oh, nice, John's classy. Yeah, so the Scovitz chicken tractor has this nice Gothic arch and there's a tarp that goes from the bottom of it all the way up to the top of the arch and then back down the other side. And what we started doing is run, running our lambs with our chickens I would take the flap from the bottom and just lift it up and bungee it to the chicken tractor next to it. And it gave the lambs a little spot to hide. So yeah, just meat, a little bit of shade. and lambs work awesome. And the cool thing about that is the lambs eat most of the grass in front of the chicken tractor. So it's easier to move your chicken tractor. All the things you learn. <laughs> yeah, great, great combo. So, but yeah, they do need some kind of shade. As far as where to get them from, we've bought ours from local farms that we either see on Craigslist or find their website. And we've been happy, I think, with, with all of them. Yeah, a feeder lamb is a product they'll know. If you say, hey, are you selling feeder lambs? It's a weaned lamb ready to leave its mama and go out into the field and eat grass. Yeah, you shouldn't have to baby it. No, it's not a bottle baby. It, it You could, but... It's much easier to just start with a feeder, a weaned lamb. Yeah, we're trying to make this easy beginner. Easy <laughs> beginner, right. Yeah, we've never got a bottle lamb to raise as a feeder. Yeah, no, we've always done weaned lambs. Um, and we really suggest, while you could do a wool lamb, find someone who breeds hair, sheep, or at least crosses a hair with a wool like what we're raising right now are Katahdin and Texel crossed lambs. The hair sheep don't need sheared. So they'll lose it. So they won't be so hot with a big woolly. Yeah. And as long coat. as we're teaching you in this episode, we're focusing on easy ways to raise meat. You don't want to deal with shearing. Shearing lambs is not something you want to mess with. So just get yourself some hair. We're talking Katahdins, St. Croix, or Dorpers. Don't know. Wiltshire horns. Wiltshire horns. Yeah, those ones. Those are the ones we've done. Best thing about raising and processing your own lambs. I think there's no better animal to learn how to process a bigger animal. Other than forget the chicken. There's no better animal to learn how to butcher than a lamb. A lamb is the easiest by far. It's to, like a deer, you always say. It's just like a deer. The reason it's easier than processing a deer, I mean, it's 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 the same. It's in your as backyard. <laughs> it's in your back. It's a little bit smaller, so you can easily throw it over your shoulder, throw it up on a table, and work with it. And if you get yourself 
the right equipment, you can actually learn how to process a lamb and mirror that on a cow. So learn on a lamb and then you can do pretty much almost anything. Again, one knife, you can butcher a whole lamb with one knife, but obviously a few extra tools are gonna make it easier for you. Uh, you're gonna wanna hang the lamb, so a couple of meat hooks, maybe a gambrel or a block and tackle to lift it up into the air and work on it. Also, uh, when it comes to killing the lamb, some people will kill the lamb by just bleeding it. I prefer... That's hard it's, to restrain them. It's hard to restrain them. You're going to get the adrenaline rushing. Unless you're really good with your animals and really good at the technique, which as a beginner, you're watching this or listening to this, you're not going to be good at it. A shot to the head with a 22 is my preferred We did... Way. I mean, you did that side-by-side -side comparison. You did one just cutting the throat. Because that's what great-grandpap used to do. Yeah, we that's heard. it. That's it. So you did it like great-grandpap and... And then you did the 22 shot. And yep. we can't tell the difference in the meat, to be honest. No, there was zero difference in flavor, texture, quality. While the one that we wound up cutting was a, a lot more adrenaline because mm -hmm. we were very hands-on with it. There was zero difference in the meat quality. But I like the lambs are out in the pasture. I can take my 22 with a scope on it. They've got feed in front of them. They're sitting there. I put a bucket down. They go down to eat out of the bucket drop the lamb and we're off yeah then you're not cutting yourself and yeah it's a little, seems a little safer yep and it doesn't believe it or not the other lambs with that one when it drops doesn't bother them the only lamb that will be bothered is the last one yeah because it's alone yeah so you're better off taking the the last two together last two fast yeah in addition to the gun, uh, having a meat saw, some kind of saw, you can use a hand saw, you can use a sawzall with a meat blade, you can use a band saw, a meat saw. And ever since that fateful day we've had with ground lamb, <laughs> I've actually, I love it now. So we do need a grinder to do the ground lamb, but we use that for the deer and for pork and chicken sometimes anyways. So it's a nice thing to have. Yeah. A vacuum sealer for packaging is nice. Yep. And I love lamb and lamb meatballs with some tzatziki sauce. One lamb, uh, they are, they're a smaller animal, so you're not going to get as much meat as you get off like a cow or a pig. But you also have to raise them in groups. Yeah. So you're getting more than one animal. Yeah, so at least start with like three lambs. Three each seems lamb. to keep them calm. Two, they're still a little on edge yeah so three lambs processed you're gonna get anywhere from like 50 60 70 pounds per lamb it, it could be a little less depending on what they were fed but you know 40 to 70 pounds per animal uh, in the freezer and we're talking steaks yeah, it's a lot more than just lamb chops or yeah. uh, lamb roast yeah you're gonna have lamb shoulder steaks lamb arm steaks uh, then you can have hindquarters steaks sirloin steaks all your chops your chops your shanks t-bones shanks lamb shanks so good lamb shanks if you've never had lamb shanks that's like oof. so good yes ribs so good. even you can do lamb ribs they're not my favorite uh, <laughs> confessions yeah lamb ribs are not no my they're not as porky delicious they're kind of lamby <laughs> lamb fat the flavor that people associate with lamb and maybe don't even like is more concentrated in the fat. And usually the ribs, there's a lot of fat on the ribs. Yeah. So you don't like my shot. ribs or my shanks. Awesome. You can oh, cook uh, both of those. I love shanks. Then, then there's the organs you can get, the fat, and then you grind everything else. You can, it's a very... You like use every little bit of it. Well, literally. There's not much left over. There is, compared to every animal we process, lamb, there is like nothing wasted. There is so, uh, pigs are like that too. Yeah. There's so little you can't use. So there's your second animal. Try this here. This is cool. If you, if you like the idea of raising lambs, we actually have a brand new field trip once in a while we film a field trip where we go to a farm and see everything they're doing on their farm. We put that in the Pioneer Library. We have a brand new sheep farm field trip. We're literally just released. So even if you're Pioneer and you're watching or listening to this, 
you probably haven't seen the sheep field trip. So check that out. It'll teach you everything you need for the basics of getting sheep lambs on your homestead. And it's where we bought our feeder lambs from. Yeah, this year we have how many out there? Four? Four, five? Five, five I think. Yeah, five Texel Katahdin crosses, and they will be in the freezer soon. Now, number three. What do you think number three is? It's not rabbits. <laughs> we already let that one out of the bag. It's no, remember, not a beef. These are things you can do in a short amount of time. You don't need to have breeders. You can source them easily. You said lamb was easier than this one. I think this one is easier than working with lambs. All right, it is. Piggies. Now, I have to say, um, it, it's easier if you buy feeder pigs and you then get breeders. good, healthy feeder pigs. Yeah. Now, this was the first animal, first four-legged animal we ever started with butchering and selling, like getting it USDA inspected, having our farm it under our farm name, and selling to our community. Yeah. Pigs were great for running a business because... One of the best parts, one of the biggest pros to doing pigs for meat, they grow so much meat so quickly. There's no other homestead animal that grows so much meat so fast. And I always thought the pork was so, it was very different than what you get from the supermarket. You could really tell the difference between our homegrown pork and what you bought from the store. It seemed like people were willing to pay extra for it. Yeah, absolutely. We know pork is delicious. They're very durable. If you get them weaned, all ready to go, they can live outside with just some three-sided shelter. You don't need a lot for their yeah. setup. Yeah, uh, pigs are like no predators. You've probably seen the video of the pigs in the pen with the bear. It actually happened in New Milford, Connecticut, where we're from. So funny. We had the same the exact same thing, thing happen. I was like, babe, this could have been our super viral video. We had a bear. The bear got into the pig pen. Unfortunately, all we had was like a bad, crappy photo of it. But the bear got in with the pigs, and the pigs were like, nah, -uh, buddy. A bear was terrified. It like sat up on a big rock hiding from the pigs. It screamed. <laughs> Bears can scream. It was like, Ooh! That's what made me go out and look. I heard this weird, creepy scream. And I was like, what is outside? There's a bear in our pig <laughs> pen. A bear. And the pigs are scaring it. <laughs> yeah, so they we never had an issue with any predation. It, I'm sure it happens. Pigs are super easy to train. So if you're new with animals and you're like not sure how to work with certain animals, pigs... Tap on your bucket when you feed them every day, and in two days, they'll be trained to a bucket. Mm -hmm. Hey, piggy, piggy, piggy. They'll come. No they matter. also, they don't poop where they sleep, so that's a nice, easy cleanup if you have a concrete pad or something for them. You don't have to go into their shelter and clean it up. One of our favorite reasons we have pigs now year-round, slop. <laughs> you can take so much food waste. Oh, yeah, all your food waste. And just magically turn it into bacon. So that's a super pro of the pig. Yeah. Uh, now, unfortunately, there are some cons to the pig. Yes, they are destructive. You'll, we had one get out. We kept them in their section that they destroyed. It was a moonscape. Uh, one of them got out one time, and I could see everywhere it went from its little snout. It just made this trail all through my yard. As soon as it got out, nose down to the ground, making a mess. Yeah. So very destructive. Also destructive. It's not destructive for them. They're just rooting because that's yeah. what they do. <laughs> Scrubbing for grubs. Scrubbing for grubs. Uh, another thing pigs will do that's very destructive on a homestead, especially if you have like a pallet homestead. <laughs> you know, like... Been there. Yeah, homestead's built of a lot of cheap materials kind of duct taped together. Pigs love to scratch. Hmm. They love to find a corner of like your pallet your chicken pen. coop or your pallet pig pen. And they hook onto that corner and they do this and, piggy yeah. butt scratch thing where they're like, oh, oh, oh. That's and a lot of force. There's a, so much force and they'll just psh, bust something in half. Or they'll easy. chew holes in it. They're chewers, so they are destructive. They're nosy. They're yep. very smart. They're very mm. nosy. 
and they'll get their little nose into everything. I've got five in my bathroom right now. So yeah, talk to me about pigs. They are stinky. Yes, if you don't, five in my bathroom right now. If you don't handle them right, if you don't manage them, they don't have to be super stinky. But, if, but they just are. Yeah. Pig poo stinks. It smells a lot worse than like cow poo does. Or, or horse, horse yeah. poo or even... Even chicken. Oh, that's a tough well, one. Well, quantity, think of Quantity. About. There's a lot more coming out of the back of the pig. Yeah, so you have to be able to manage that. There, and because of that, there actually is pig-specific regulations. regulations with your town. You might find, like, you can have lots of livestock, but no pigs. So you can't put your pigs right next to your neighbor's property line. There yeah. are some setbacks. Yep. Is that what they're called, setbacks? Yeah, nice. Nice job. They are feed dependent. If you're raising pigs as a feeder pig, so we're not talking like a slow growing cooney cooney, we're talking we want this pig done in six months, four to six months, yeah. they'll be dependent on a lot of grain. Yeah, so you're going to spend a lot of money feeding them that grain. You're going to have to store that grain and ship that grain. So it's, uh, they're a lot of extra. There's a lot of cons on this pig list. That's why I think they're the hardest. Water is also very important. They cannot ever run out of water. Yeah. They will tip over every bucket you put water in. So you do have to rig up a very pig specific watering situation. It's funny you say that. Like, I think pigs, they were the second animal we did. And I think they're easier than like sheep because I have had so much more experience with them. And when you build for pigs, when you have the right infrastructure, I think they're easier. So a concrete pad <laughs> with pig panels and a three-walled structure and a nipple water with a hose attached that they have no access to the hose, right? Like it's got to be a very specific to pig setup. Yeah, are they easier? Are they, are they easier than lambs? That's a toughie. I don't know. Think about the water. It's water for pigs, all the feed hauling. You still yeah. need the fencing. Fencing can be lower, but I guess that's a pro. And they are harder to butcher than anything else on the list. That's true. I will admit they are harder. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe you're going to change my mind here. Cheaper. Pigs are easier than sheep. Change my mind. Okay, you so will what do you need? need. So we talked you about our, yeah. our setup that we had at our first farm for pigs. You can do something not so elaborate. You don't need a concrete yeah, pad. Yeah, no. But because you're not having them year round, try to have them in a nice time of the year for them. Yeah, basically you need you need for pigs fencing that's buried. Yeah. Or fencing that has a little bit of electric electric to keep line them at nose level. At nose level. You need shade. They need some shade. You need an area they can wallow. So they'll make it, just they'll find a wet area you have there and they'll just make it a little pool for themselves. So your water system needs to not only quench their thirst, but also allow them to, you know. If that's where you want it. Take yeah. a bath in the mud and get all cooled down because pigs need to wallow. Uh, you Because they require so much food, you also need to make sure there's some food storage. Because you're going to have a pallet of feed or, you know, 10 bags of feed sitting there. You don't yeah. want the mice and rats getting into it. So big so. Rubbermaid container, garbage can Yep, something. we've done garbage can, totes on wheels. We've done big Rubbermaids. We've done it all. <laughs> it doesn't have to be complicated, but there has to be some thought put into it. Yeah. Once you have all that stuff ready, uh, finding pigs shouldn't be too difficult. And, and this is the rule of thumb. We told you with chickens, get a Cornish cross. We told you with lambs, get a hair sheep. With pigs, we have pretty much always said the breed, forget the mini pigs. We're not talking about mini pigs. So yet. not Cooney Coonies, not the guinea hogs. And the weird little stuff. But, but just forget the weird littler, smaller stuff. Just focus on your heritage or your commercial style pigs. It's not so important to pick a specific breed. We've raised Tamworths, Berkshires, Hampshire, Hampshire, Landrace Crosses. Now we got the Cooney Coonies, IPPs. They're all delicious. They've all been delicious. There will be some people who buy into the the name of this one Berkshire special, pork. super amazing thing. It tasted just the same as our commercial pink pig. It was delicious. It tasted the same. Couldn't tell the difference. 
We'll have to do now we're raising Cooney Coonies, IPPs, and... Now we're talking about the full-size breeds. We're yeah. not talking about the little ones right, right. put in here. Yeah. So yeah, yeah Cooney Cooney, I feel like it's so fatty, I think you'll taste a difference. Yeah, Cooney Coonies we actually do think taste a little bit better. But, but the point here is... They're all really, really They're good. They're all really good. They're all, even the commercial pink piggies, when you raise them on your farm, taste so good. So if you can find somebody local to you who, hey, they have piglets for sale. Reliably. Reliably. Right? Every year they have piglets for they're, sale. They're a nice size. They're weaned. They're cut. Healthy. It's what you're looking for with your management system. And that person cares about you. Right, that person's like, he, oh, you want, want pigs? They want you to succeed. Well, why don't you come see my setup? Uh, you know, what do you want to know? Not somebody who's just like, yeah, I got five pigs. I'll meet you down at the tractor supply. Get them in your car. Yeah, it's it's somebody who you can you send a text, say, hey, this pig's coughing. What do I do? To be fair, we have purchased pigs from a lot of different people. And it's been about 50-50, like, breeders who care about us and the pigs Versus I'll meet you at Tractor Supply. Which yes. is, I mean, when you have experience, go for Tractor Supply. But yeah, if we're that's saying all you can find. When you're just getting started, find a good, reliable breeder and then get whatever they have. Younger piglets will need more care and they can be very fragile. They'll need heat. They'll need a very high protein diet. So they're harder. Get a piglet who's eight weeks or older. I'm saying it because they're younger, they're harder. Yeah. You might find a six-week-old that's a bigger, really hardy, hefty, and ready to go. It's not impossible, but if they're eight weeks, they're going to be easier. So yeah. the further along you can find a weaned pig, the easier it's going to be for you. And at that yeah, point, they you're transition just, easier. Yep. And then you're just growing that thing in six months. Austin, he would keep just a feeder full. You buy a pig feeder, a hog feeder from Tractor Supply. The pig learns to get in there, push it up, and eats. And just keep that filled. We just let them The water and the feed, feed were themselves. both automatic. They literally fed and watered themselves. Some people argue it's better to take feed away at night. Sure, go if you want to do that. But like, we, but we raised a hundred pigs letting them feed themselves and water themselves and they turned out mwah, so good delicious so good five to six months after you've purchased this little feeder pig it will be 300 maybe 400 pounds on the foot that will be a hanging weight of anywhere from 250 to 350 pounds not an easy thing to butcher right. at home by yourself if you've never butchered anything, I would not suggest you start with a pig. Pigs have a couple of unique things to them that make them trickier, where I would suggest getting a lamb, trying a lamb or a deer. Pigs, the biggest one is the hide. Okay, so uh, I... Not hide, not hide, right? Skin. The, the hair. The hair. The skin. But I would start even before that, the actual killing. Ooh, that's a good point. They're very strong. That's a really good point. When you kill a pig to, for processing, when you kill a pig for processing, you have to stun it. So usually a 22 to the forehead. You stun the pig and then you, to bleed it out properly, you have to stick the pig. And that requires like two people stunning Getting the pig flipped over, holding it, and bleeding it. It's very scary because the pig, meanwhile, is going through death throes this whole time. Yeah, And they're very strong. Very strong. So you so need to... So to hold it yeah. and have somebody stab it, you really got to trust that stabbing yeah. person. Yeah, <laughs> your stabbing partner's got to be someone you work well with. So yeah, it, it, it is more challenging to actually kill the pig, properly bleed the pig... And they're a lot bigger than a lamb, so like to lift that pig up, you're going to need a, some kind of hoist or machine or tractor. Everything is more difficult when butchering a pig versus a lamb or a chicken. So for your first time, get a butcher. Lots of lots of places have local slaughterhouses and butchers who can do it for you. But don't wait till the week before it's ready to go to call the butcher. No. Find the person who you're going to buy pigs from. And then find someone nearby who the day you're Maybe they your recommend pig, it to you. Six months from there can book you a, a, a date. Because right now it's still butchers are six months to a year to two years out. Yeah. So make sure. Because if you have to do it yourself, 
It's, it's possible. It's possible, but it took us years to get to the point where yeah. we felt comfortable. If you are doing it yourself, what do you need? To do your own pig, again, you're definitely going to need for a pig like a 22 to stun the pig. Then a knife to stick the pig, bleed it out, open it up. At that point, you know, again, your saws, whether that's a hand saw, a sawzall with a meat blade, or a band saw, all those will work. Scalding method. Right. Uh, unique to the pig, you have, as opposed to like a hide that's on a cow or a sheep that can be removed, a pig has hair. You can't take a knife and easily get the hair off. No. You basically... You could skin it. But you're losing a lot of a lot of product, fat. yeah. And we tried it one year. We did a two pig comparison. We scalded one and we skinned one, and there was so much waste on the skinned pig. Not just fat, which is one of your precious Delicious. parts. Delicious. But in the curves of the pig, with without being skilled, you lose meat too. A super highly skilled butcher can do this. Our butcher. Used to be able to skin pigs and, and not lose anything. But if you don't do it much, you're going to lose a lot. So I suggest go with the scalding. To do that, you need some kind of container. Big barrel. You can dip that the... you can heat. Heat up and then dip the pig down into it and then scrape it with what's called a bell scraper. It looks like a bell with a handle. It's hollow in it though. So it's like a cup. You just use that to scrape all that hair off. It's a lot of work. Yeah. The the scalding and the scraping is a lot of extra work. You want to do it at a cooler time of the year. Sometimes you could get a butcher who will kill, dress, and scald your pig for you. And then you can do all the custom cutting. Mm -hmm. We actually did that a couple times. We had a pig. We dropped it off to the butcher. They killed it, scalded it, no hair left on it, then dressed it out. And then we picked up the carcass and cut it up or used it we for did a pig roast. roast or... So that's a great way to, if you're like a little bit afraid of the harder parts of the pig. Or but... it's just you, so it's hard for you to do just yeah, yourself. Yeah, maybe you do that and then you pick up your hanging pig or even they could cut it into quarters for you and you'd be good to go. And then the additional work that goes into a pig is if you want your bacon to taste like bacon, you have to cure it and then smoke it. Same thing with your hams. They don't come off the pig tasting like bacon you get from the store. That's additional step and, and learning required. Yeah, it just hit me as you're talking. <laughs> like We have said so many more additional things with the pig. Yes. They are harder to raise and process, which is the title of this so podcast. So they're number three they on the list of hard. harder to raise and process on your homestead. So I'll give you that. They're definitely a lot more involved with the pig. Because every corner we turn Don't forget like, you got to do this. Good. Don't forget and, you got to do this. And also and with the And then there's the packaging. And... So sure, they're harder. But... You get bacon. Yeah. You so get it. Pork Which everybody chops. loves. Everybody loves bacon. Now you cannot get your whole pig turned into bacon. <laughs> you you can get it all turned to sausages, but don't do that. Because there's so many good things on a pig. Oh, You've got man. your shoulders and your roasts and your chops and your ribs, your hams. Oh, my goodness. We ran out of pork a for, few months ago. Yeah. We haven't had it for And then you magically found like a little pocket in one of our deep freezers that had a couple mm -hmm. like pork chops. pork chops and ribs, like a few of our favorites. You did a pulled pork. Mm. Oh man, I was like, oh. I and that's what made this. us go out and buy feeder pigs. Four feeder pigs. We now have a bunch of feeder pigs out back because we're like, our heritage breed pigs are growing really slow and we just want a ton of pork. So we went and got some Yorkshire land race crosses to do like we used to always do. Pigs acknowledged. Pigs are more difficult of the three. Fortunately for you out there, if you want to learn everything you need to know to get feeder pigs from start to end, we have a master class in the Pioneer Library. Everything you need to know about raising feeder pigs is going to help you get from point A to point B. Covers all this stuff in way more detail. You'll enjoy that, Pioneers. And if you're not a Homesteady Pioneer, there's a link in the podcast description. There's something popping up on the YouTube screen. You can become a pioneer for five bucks a month. You'll learn about meat chickens, lambs, pigs, and all kinds of other in-depth homesteading stuff. It's like the Netflix for homesteading education videos. 
Now, of all these three animals, chickens, pigs, lambs, what are we doing this year? <laughs> all of them. We're doing all three. Yeah. We really do love them all that much that they're they're filling our freezers. They pull a ton of weight when it comes to freezer filling. They are, I mean, we get a lot of meat in the freezer from these yep. three. Our chicken freezer will be full. Our lamb freezer will be full. Uh, the pork one we split with our beef freezer. And yeah. And this year we may have a full pork one too, hopefully. If you're listening and you're like, I'm going to do it this year. I've, I've never raised meat before, but I'm going to do it. Don't do all three. Pick one. Yeah, pick one. We didn't start with all three. We started with meat chickens. Yeah. And then we did pigs, but added, we didn't butcher added them. Added pigs, right. Yeah, we didn't butcher them. Then we did uh, pigs and we did butcher them. Mm. Then we did lambs and we did butcher them. So, you know, each year... Work up to it. Pick whatever one you heard and said, that one sounds like it'll work best for me in my homestead. Try that this year. And don't force yourself to butcher it. No, you don't have to. Yeah, the first year, butchering is a different skill than animal husbandry. That's why there's professional farmers and professional butchers. So this year, get it and raise it and then learn to butcher it or vice versa. Buy a whole pig from a local farm and learn to butcher it yourself and then the next year raise it. Yeah, or butcher one of your chickens. And if you do that and you're like, okay, I could do this, then do the rest of them or... Or find somebody who can butcher them. And if you do that over the next decade, you'll wind up where we don't buy meat. We haven't bought meat in years. And uh, it's a major, major part of our groceries. We don't have to worry about. Yeah, it's a really nice thing for a family to know. We always can put meat on the table. Vegetables, on the other hand. Yeah. We're a little handicapped in that area. You said like some all. If you want to know more about raising chickens, pigs, or sheep, as we already mentioned, there's a lot more educational information in the Pioneer Library. There's also butcher videos which will help you processing on farm. You can become a Pioneer for just five bucks a month, or you can buy a year-long membership and get two months for free. There's also discounts in the Pioneer Library for a lot of stuff that you need to buy for your homestead. For example, fruit trees and fruit bushes and that sort of thing. You get some discounts from different companies who work with us. John Siskovich's books you can get at a discount if you want to build the John Siskovich chicken tractor. You can even join us live when we interview special guests. A couple episodes that are coming up, you might be interested in joining us live for the interview. We're going to be talking with Robin from Cheese from Scratch about cheese making on April 27th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. If you're a pioneer, you can join us live for that interview and you can ask questions of Robin at the end of the show. In the month of May, we're gonna be talking to Jason from Farm Builder about pasturing pigs and cows together. Jack from the Mindful Homestead is gonna be coming on soon. There's a lot of shows. If you're a pioneer, you can join us for the interview, ask questions of the guests live. We'd love to have you. You'll get an invite in your email inbox. Just click on the link in the description of this podcast or that just popped up on your screen to become a pioneer. You help us produce this show, but in return, you get access to all kinds of in-depth homesteading information, discounts on products, and you get to join live to ask questions of experts who we interview. It's an awesome program. I love being a pioneer because I get to learn from all these different experts we have on the show, and I know you're going to love it too.